All right, welcome everyone to the Solana Foundation Validator Discussion, September 5th, 2024. Agenda today is pretty light. Uh, some validator updates, a reminder again about Breakpoint, only 15 days away. And then um, some topics for discussion. I've got a couple things that I've been seeing talked about in Discord a lot lately, but open to whatever people want to talk about. Uh, so first, mainnet updates. 118.23 is recommended for mainnet. Uh, just as a, a logistical thing, there will be no feature activations between now and after breakpoint. Uh, so for the next two or three weeks, um, mainnet will just kind of be as is. Uh, the 2.0 cycle for bringing 2.0 to mainnet will start sometime after breakpoint. I'm not sure in the exact timing yet because testnet has to be um, downgraded and upgraded, uh, but sometime after breakpoint, you can expect that to start within a few weeks, I'd imagine. Uh -huh. OK. Uh, another quick note about 2.0. So 2.0 will be, I mentioned already, recommended for adoption after breakpoint. Um, if people aren't aware already, there are some things that you might need to do as an operator uh, for the 2.0 transition especially RPC operators. Uh, I'll open up this guide. So there's a guide here that I'll link to in um, the chat as well. Uh, but this sort of outlines all the different things that are changing in the uh, change from 1.x to 2.0 Agave. Uh, so first of all, Solana Validator, Solana Ledger Tool, all these binaries will now be renamed to Agave. Um, and the Solana Labs repo will no longer be shipping changes. So if you are currently getting your builds or building from the Solana Labs repo, you have to switch to the Agape repo. Uh, so this doc walks you through the changes there. Um, the other big thing, uh, again, is for RBC operators. So all of these methods have been deprecated for a while in Agave. In 2.0, they will be removed and replaced with methods on the right-hand side. So confirm transaction, get signature status, et cetera. Uh, will all be uh, removed in 2.0 if you're an RPC operator or if you, uh, you know, you use your favorite RPC operator, make sure they're aware of this and um, aware of what changes are coming. Ideally, RPC operators would also uh, communicate to all their users, but in general, these things should be um, planned for ahead of time. Uh, yeah, it looks like Slowblaze already put the link in there. so. Again, read up more um, on this transition. Uh, it's coming up probably within a month or so. Um, so especially for RPC operators, be aware. Uh, another thing that's a little bit further down the line is a feature activation for this direct memory mapping change that's happening in Agave. Uh, the biggest thing here to be aware of, 99% of transactions will be just fine on the cluster or more. Um, but there are some small set of um, programs that create transactions that actually try to write to read-only memory. And because of a quirk in the implementation right now, uh, that does not fail, uh, but it will fail when this feature activation happens. Uh, so expect more comms about that soon. I think Jacob has already started that with developers, uh, but just be aware if you have a program that is doing any sort of writing to read-only memory, even if you're writing the value that is already there, uh, it will start to fail in uh, Agave 2.0 after direct mapping is enabled. Any questions about either of those 2.0 migration or direct mapping? Yeah, Barrett, go ahead. Um, so I'm just wondering what the plan with documentation is. So if if we the the PRs that get merged into master, are they going to keep getting deployed to docs.solana labs when where we then redir redirect people or uh, yeah. Oh, good. That's a great question. Um, so docs.solana labs is sort of there for historical reasons back when um, the Anza team was part of Solana labs. That is going away. Uh, so I believe it is already not getting the latest docs on Solana labs because um, 2.0 is no longer being pushed to the Solana labs repo. Uh, so I think very soon there should be um, new docs updated on the Anza XYZ site. Uh, I don't know what the status is right now, but it should be up, I think, relatively soon. Thanks. 
question. Yeah, Blake, go ahead. Sorry, I was looking for the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Okay, again, word of mouth. Uh, if anybody knows of someone that's an RPC operator or you know, just a user of RPCs, make sure that they have seen this doc uh, because 2.0 may break whatever setup they've got going on. All right, moving right along. Uh, testnet, not much going on with testnet right now. 2.0.8 is recommended for testnet. Uh, as I mentioned, after breakpoint, we'll have the normal um, downgrade and upgrade and restart cycle um, before we recommend 2.0 for mainnet adoption. Uh, just want to say thank you to all the operators who participated in the last restart on testnet. Um, I think it was you know pretty well managed and organized for a, a testnet restart. It, you know, it took about 24 hours, but I think that's about the time frame I'd expect for a restart. So good job all. Any questions about testnet or the, the restart that happened? All right, moving along. Uh, breakpoint is 15 days away, so breakpoint is coming up fast. Uh, I'm going to be leaving next week to be kind of in the area, um, and yeah, I'm I'm excited to see people in person. Hopefully, some new faces that I haven't seen in person before. So, if you haven't gotten your tickets, uh, why wait? Get them now. Hurry up. I'll uh, see you in Singapore. And of course, all of our favorite side events are happening before Breakpoint. So Block Zero is on the 18th, uh, Stake Points on the 19th, and MEV DeFi Day is also on the 19th. So really hope to see all of you at all those events. Um, is anyone from any of those events on the call wants to add any details about content or logistics? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, Chris, I think you're muted, or did you want to say something? Uh, no, can't hear you. It looks like you're still muted, though. Uh, Michael, if you want to add anything as well. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't know what... Uh... Chris was going to say, I thought maybe I could just step in if he's not able to. Um, but yeah, so block zero obviously is happening on the 18th and agenda is looking really good. Um, we're going to have uh, Turley and Dan there and uh, the guys from Jump and someone from Anza and yeah, some really good topics. We'll talk about validator economics as well and yeah. Um, Kind of everything that's been going on with the validator landscape so it'll be a really good event um this is really geared towards validators so any validators that are going to be in singapore this is really for you so yeah please uh come and uh, pull through awesome thank you michael um i don't know if ah, brian go ahead yeah i was just going to chime in uh this is brian from judo hey everyone um that the attendance for um, any of these events has been crazy in terms of RCPs, just because it's adjacent to Token 2049. And so um, Block Zero is definitely targeted to the exact people on this call to the extent that you um, haven't had your attendance accepted or anything, then please try and reach out to one of the organizers and we can try and get you accepted. It's, it's like well beyond capacity, but this crew has um, our screw has, has priority and we'll, we'll try and make it work. But there's like a thousand people to sift through, as you can imagine. And so um, if things can fall through the cracks. So I uh, just wanted to give that disclaimer, but that we hope we can accommodate everyone on this call and all your peers. Cool. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, like everyone said, uh, really excited to see people at these events, I think. You know, all of them have been a big success in the past, and it, it's just uh, great to see validator focused, uh, validator operator focused events. So, really cool. Thank you to all the organizers. Um, all right. And now we don't really have any specific agenda items. Um, I thought we'd open it up for discussion. 
there's been a lot of talk uh block zero content we've already kind of covered but timely vote credits has been discussed recently and i don't know where that conversation is at right now it looks like the discord channel has kind of died down um zantetsu also open sourced some of the voting changes he's made so i don't know if anyone wants to comment on that or any other topics which are floating around out there I guess, sorry, I should have raised my hand, but um, does the foundation have any position on Zan's mods? Um, I will say that uh, I think I'm glad that he open sourced them. I think it's better to be open sourced than not. Um, I think that largely these changes will have a lot less of an effect once timely vote credits is enabled. So from that standpoint, I think they're um, fine to open source. Uh, as far as the delegation program specifically, I, I don't think, yeah, because of the sort of like everyone has access now, I don't know if the mods will, will change much. Um, so I don't know if the delegation program will take any sort of stance on them. I think it's more of like a, do your own research and if you think it will help you you can use it if not don't um i i would just caution everyone to be aware that if you're going to modify your client you should be really really fully aware of what all the mods are doing and how they're working um don't just blindly take code and apply it to your validator especially for something as sensitive as voting um because you know you're also fully you know responsible if anything goes wrong if you get locked out for an hour or something bad happens to your node, that's, you know, again, your responsibility, not the foundation. So I think that's where I'd leave. Yeah, and that, that, that biggest lockout, the, the potential for locking yourself out for an extended period of time, um, you know, even, even a past like a day is probably the biggest risk. So if you are going to choose to run something like this, like you really need to understand what the mods are doing, what the parameters you've chosen, or, or just you know, like, or opt to not do it if, if you don't feel comfortable. I really don't think it's a good idea to to run code that you don't understand. That's not already kind of like fully proven out on the cluster level. So you know, if these mods like were kind of run through testnet with everyone running it, you know, with specific parameters, then like you know, then that would everyone would sort of see, okay, this works. There isn't any danger for you know mass lockouts. That would be like I think the biggest risk. If, if if one were to run it, or if, if many if many validators were to run it, well, yeah, Michael, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to add. I mean, Ben addressed the the lockout thing. Um, it's happened to me previously, where like two years ago, I had like a, a over a sixty minute lockout, and it's the most stressful thing that you can experience because you it, it's it's really hard to figure out how long you're going to be locked out for. So luckily, it was only sixty minutes. But in that moment, you're thinking like, "Wow, like you're done, right? Like this could go on for days." Um, and just in the in the importance of really like reading the code and understanding what those changes are doing, um, uh, there could be a honeypot in there, right? Like it could be um, just siphoning off a couple lampots lampots from your um, identity you know, every few minutes or something like that. And um, at the same time, like, yeah, how do you know that that's exactly the code that Zan is running, right? Because we know that his uh, performance has been good, his stability is great, but you know, maybe there's something being held back. Maybe you run that and it's really unstable. So um, making sure you really like are able to understand any changes that you run on your validator is really important. The other factor is that this isn't on the Jito validator. So you need to also be able to and be comfortable manually incorporating um, all of Jito's changes, the bundle engine and um, all of that, and merging all of that and making sure that that resulting Frankenstein validator can run reliably. Um, and then lastly, the, the kind of configuration. Um, I just want to say that anyone who does try this, please be reasonable with your uh, settings. Don't go and like, set your um, threshold to like 80% or whatever um, because you think that's going to like give you the maximum credits. 
um, it's probably going to harm you. And if a lot of people do it, it's going to harm the cluster. And that's really an own goal for all of us. Um, yeah, that's kind of all of it. Yep, go ahead. So I guess I'm kind of lacking historical context here, but does anybody think that this is worth PRing back into Anza core? Or is that, am I just kind of beating a dead horse here where I know there were discussions two years ago about moving these in and and Anza wasn't really interested. I'm not sure if that's a dumb idea to do again. It's like for, for the reasons that mods don't exist sort of like on the, 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 the standard client, there is additional risks that that client that that those mods take, which is to over potentially overcommit to a specific fork. So that like Anza believes, um, you know, and the consensus team has believed that it's not worth the additional risk for um, the cluster to try to get ahead. Hopefully, TVC will help the incentives where like any of the backfilling and overcommitting will become less. Um, effective with TVC and then if everyone's doing it it would be it would be no difference at all like like there wouldn't be an edge to run it and so that that's been their stance and like then the prioritization right there's lots of other things within the the Anza um, client that can be optimized and improved and this this isn't a major concern in TVC thing than making sure that the most possible vote credits are achieved Okay, so it sounds sounds like it's not not worth bringing up with doing another PR, trying to get Zans mods merged in, right? Yeah, pr probably not. Thank you. If I can just also jump in on that on that last point, um, I want to just m mention that there's essentially three components to these mods, right? There's um, one is backfilling, um, the other is fork choice, and the other is um, lagging, which kind of addresses fork choice. Um, so maybe two components. And TVC broadly addresses the lagging aspect. So, um, you know, waiting to commit to a fork uh, until a certain amount of stake is committed and then only uh, voting for it. So that, to some degree, is going to be much less effective once we have TVC. But with um, backfilling, I think it's a little more nuanced and I think there's much less consensus risk. If you're saying that I've voted on my last voted slot was slot um, one, and then slots two, three, four, five, I didn't vote because I wasn't sure. And then for slot six, I'm like, okay, cool, that's a good fork, and I'm voting on slot six. And the parents of slot six are two, three, four, five. So by voting on slot six, you are implicitly also voting on slots two, three, four, five. So backfilling is basically saying, okay, well, when you vote on six, you're also voting on two, three, four, five, which the standard validator doesn't do. So it's not capturing those, those credits. I don't think, um, in my opinion, um, that that is really much of a consensus risk. It's a kind of a question of what's neater, what's tidier. Are you kind of leaving credits on the table and maybe you shouldn't vote for them because you didn't explicitly at that point decide that you approve of those those blocks or that fork. Um, but that is the, the biggest, I think, component of the effectiveness um, of, of these mods in particular. And that is probably less controversial. So um, Anza is probably not going to take it because they don't really see a point or a value in it. Um, I think Ashwin has spoken on that point previously. I don't remember his exact position. And unfortunately, Zan's not here to uh, defend his side. Um, yeah, Ben, counter? Yeah, um, to add on to that, though, the with TVC, the backfilling becomes significantly less valuable because those happened later so like the amount of vote credits you get for backfilling things that happened previously is now going to be significantly reduced almost potentially some of them to the point where they're not valuable at all sort of another reason for Anza not to do that the other sort of slight negative externality here for backfilling is you you now have committed far further further into that fork so when you're when you're looking when, you when it's calculating lockouts it's looking at every single vote down that fork so if you were to say, say if you switched over to that that fork and then kind of at, at slot six and you backfill you're you're that much more committed but two to end slots more committed to that fork and so if, if it things swing back the other way then you are going to have a harder time switching over. It's going to take you longer. So I think those are the primary reasons why I would imagine that Anza has not had a high appetite to uptake these odds. And in, and with TVC, that difference will be less effective.
Uh, if I can just throw in one kind of controversial suggestion here. Uh, and obviously their interest is network security and everything. Um, Jito could potentially incorporate the odds, uh, the, the mods on, on their side. So I don't know if they want to address that. But uh, theoretically, we do have a, a separate client team here that could distribute something. Yeah, Lucas from Jito here. Um, we've been asked this a few times. I think we generally try not to touch consensus because it's kind of a scary uh, box to touch. So my initial reaction is probably wouldn't add that. I guess people can do what they want with their validators, but well, I would prefer not to touch and break consensus. <laughs> Makes sense. But I, I, I do imagine that the changes are pretty straightforward to apply to the JITA validators because we don't touch consensus. So the, the diff between JITA Solana and Agave is on replay and consensus is uh, non-existent. How about uh, there's a bit of chat about TVC. Um, I know previously there was some concern brought up by Brian Long about um, the the amount of grace period we have in TVC and potentially changing it. Um, is there any more discussion on that? It seems like the channel has gone a little quiet. The only thing on that front that, that I would like to add is I think that value and a few other values like CU limits um, should be um, account values at some point in the future. I think we mentioned it last time, but that is something I would like to see put forward. I mean, maybe maybe that needs to be a SIMD that needs to get written and, and prioritized. But that is something that I see as important and, and something that I would like to see governance be able to manage over time. Yeah, I think I'd second that. Um, there's a, a desire at Anza as well to have these sort of settings for the cluster be more configurable and not just in the code. Um, so, you know, I think that's a good opportunity for validator governance to kind of spearhead some of those changes. All right. Any other topics people want to bring up? Still pretty early in the call. Yeah, you could go ahead. So, do you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, people here from Sun Foundation and Jita of top, but very curious. What do you think about if someone filters the bundles with front run? Are you talking about basically unbundling and rebundling? Uh, it's it's not kinda, but not. Uh, I think I talk about just filter, just filter front run. It's like a custom client, like a Jita, but no. And uh, what do you think? Maybe legal issues, or I don't know. I'm not sure about uh, legal issues, but I think. The foundation has been clear. If if you're front running as a delegation program participant, you'll be rejected. Lucas from Gito here. Um, can talk more about this offline, but that's something that we tried to do earlier this year, in like December and January, and it just turns into a giant cat and mouse game where people were figuring out what the filter was in adjusting their strategy to get around the filter. And it just felt like a uh, like we wouldn't feel comfortable saying that this was doing something and it wasn't fully doing it. So, but uh, we should talk more offline about that. It, when, and you're talking about like cat and mouse, just so I understand, you, you're kind of meaning like, all right, you have one way to detect it and then, then, then searchers may or may not start 
like obfuscating the actual trade amongst like kind of padded up other transactions and other activity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. I do want to throw out that Paladin does this, and since it's slightly different than Gito, and on top of Gito, it does filter what we consider front running, i.e., using the same venue to trade in different directions and different prices by different multi signers. And that would have that same potential weakness of as soon as someone figures out how you're filtering it, they just change how they're sending them. Uh, I disagree, but I don't want to make it about Paladin. Happy to talk about it. If you do it at GTO, then it could go somewhere else. I, I think our solution solved it. Is Paladin open source yet, or are we still waiting? Currently open source to the validators who are running it. So any validator here, reach out to me. We'll add you to the GitHub, etc. We didn't open it completely to everybody else because we're hardening it. That's not open source. I, ag I agree that is not open source. It is not open source yet. All right, any other topics? If not, we can end early. All right, we'll call it a meeting. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you all at Breakpoint. And uh, the, the call in October will be at the normal time, so the second Thursday of the month. All right, thank you.